Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Two hours of horror stories, as per usual. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Liking the video helps out so, so much. Let's see if we can reach 1,000 likes on this one. Of course, only if you feel this video is deserving of it. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated, as this time I promise I will be posting <laughs> videos just like this all the time. Anyways, sit back, relax, grab a coffee, pack a bowl, whatever it is that you do to relax. Enjoy the video, tell somebody you love them, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I'm a pediatric psychologist. I help children and their parents deal with psychological problems relating to almost anything. That can be helping children deal with emotional distress as they grow up, coping with learning disabilities and helping children find strategies to adapt to wider society. Most of the time, the issues I deal with aren't real life threatening. They're serious, but I really just help children and parents to help themselves more than anything. Except for the incident I'm about to tell you. I love my job. I help children to overcome obstacles in their lives and reach their full potential. The sense of accomplishment and joy that I see in the faces of children and parents is something I just couldn't experience in any other job. So when Mary, the mother of Jonathan, told me she believed her son's imaginary friend had become real, I took the case with a morbid sense of curiosity. Tell me about your friend, Jonathan. What's their name? What do they look like? The blonde five-year-old John wouldn't look up at me. He only stared at the ground, frightened. We hadn't even begun the session and he was already closed off. It would be difficult to establish trust with the boy if he couldn't open up. I was contemplating asking his mother Mary to leave the room before she interjected. Mr. Bighead wears a tuxedo with one of those red bow ties like he's going to some fancy dress party. But it's his head. It's big and round. Mr. Big Head. Duh, obviously. But it's like one of those smiley face yellow Pac-Man sized heads and he never stops smiling. Has John drawn pictures of Mr. Big Head? No. John doesn't have to. I've seen him. I was a bit surprised by Mary's answer. This session wasn't just about John anymore. I was looking for possible behaviors from his parents that enabled such a dangerous illusion to manifest in John's young, developing mind. You say you've seen Mr. Bighead before, Mary. Where have you seen Mr. Bighead? Mary shook her head and I could tell that she was more stressed than John. Outside the house? He was just staring from outside the house out on the street out front. I didn't understand it. At first, I thought some guy got lost, maybe being paid to be a mascot or something. I don't know. But then I told him to get lost and he didn't say anything. Then I saw him again and I had enough and I called the police. When they arrived, nope, disappeared into thin air. It sounds so stupid that it couldn't be real. I don't want to believe it. I thought I was going crazy, Doc. We don't use that word here. I'm here to help you with John's imagination in a constructive way. You really mustn't be so negative on yourself. This was starting to get dangerous. An imaginary friend for children can sometimes act as a constructive method to socially interact with the world, a plaything to practice social roleplay. But his mother was simply exacerbating a potentially harmless fantasy into an outright dangerous delusion based on an encounter with a stranger. My initial hypothesis was shared psychosis, or folie du, as the French call it. When one individual strongly believes something, this can cause those around that individual to also strongly believe in the delusion or fantasy. I decided it was best to avoid the topic of Mr. Big Head for now. Establishing trust and gaining a detailed social history would allow me to help the poor boy and his mother. We started talking about the family situation and I discovered that Mary had actually been widowed shortly after Jonathan was born. 
Her husband had died in a car accident. A mixture of poor weather conditions and drunk driving. I had an inkling that this tragedy perhaps played into the creation of Mr. Bighead, but I decided it would be best to leave that particular theory for the next session. From there, we discussed more mundane topics such as her employment with a department store, the stress from increasing mortgage payments and grocery bills, how Mary had to make the choice between Taco Tuesday and Pizza Friday. That little topic got John talking for the first time. A good sign. Then we moved on to John and how he was finding elementary school, what his friends were like, his life aspirations. All things considered, John was a normal little boy, except for this Mr. Big Head character that had his mother worrying. Our hour was up. I rescheduled another appointment for tomorrow and wished John and his mother a good evening. I wish I could have said the same for me. There were only a couple more appointments that evening. Nothing too dramatic, thankfully. So when I went to the car park, I was still in a rather calm mood. It was only when I walked to the car door did I pause. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I could see a silhouette of a man with a large, round head. It was ridiculous. Mr. Big Head doesn't exist. There's no reason for him to be stalking me in this car park. But do I look? Do I just drive off? Curiosity demands that I look. But what would I be curious about? A child's imaginary friend is at a car park? That's not possible, and to look would only be feeding into an overactive imagination. But if I don't look, then I'm leaving myself vulnerable. Or is it the other way around? Don't predators start to chase the prey once the prey reacts? Stupid, stupid, stupid. I snapped out of it and looked at the figure. It was no Mr. Big Head. It was just the stop sign at the entrance of the car park. I sighed in relief and got in the car. Reason and logic. One, child's imagination. Zero. Before I went home, I stopped by the grocery store to pick up some essentials. Milk and bread were my priorities. But it would be no big deal if I accidentally walked through the candy aisle and picked up some chocolate. During Easter, I always struggled to decide between chocolate eggs or a chocolate bunny. The more important decisions a man must make, right? As I stood there contemplating differences in textures, variety of fillings, and price per pound, I saw it again. Or... I thought I saw it. Mr. Big Head. He only passed the end of the aisle for a second, but I was convinced that I saw his massive head walked past. Or did I? It was ridiculous. I couldn't be seeing a child's imaginary friend in a grocery store of all places. Is he shopping for milk after work too? No, no he wasn't. So I marched down the aisle to prove myself wrong and saw the back of him. His massive head, his tuxedo suit, his polished black shoes. Walking in a grocery store so casual, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This giant pale head amongst us ordinary people. No one was staring at him, taking any notice. I felt like a freak, an outcast going insane because only I noticed him. Then he turned around. Sir, would you like some Easter eggs? Said the voice of a teenage boy beneath the giant white rabbit mascot head with the broken ears. He held out a tray of Easter eggs right in front of me. I took two from the tray. I meekly said thank you and told him his ears were broken. He said the manager had to break the ears, otherwise the costume would keep hitting the aisle signs overhead. I nodded my head and walked to the checkout. Reason and logic? Two. Child's imagination, and a very embarrassed psychologist. Zero. It was dark when I got home. I didn't even get through the front door of my house before I had already finished the two chocolate eggs. I guess embarrassment makes me hungry. At least my grocery store story would make a bemusing personal anecdote for Mary and John tomorrow. 
I lived by myself, so there was no lights on waiting for me, so I half stumbled in the dark to the kitchen where I could lay down the shopping on the bench. You would think an accredited psychologist like me would have a loving family waiting for me at home. My own rugrats with their own imaginary friends, but life keeps getting in the way, you know? I turned on the light. Not that I needed the light, really. I had stumbled to the fridge during the middle of the night enough times to know where everything was with my eyes closed. I sorted the refrigerated groceries first and then walked over to the cupboard when I thought I saw it. The silhouette of a giant head through the window in my backyard. But I stopped and did a double take. If it was there, it was gone now. A cat? Possibly the moonlight? I had played this game enough today and shrugged my shoulders. No getting carried away that time. Not in the mood to cook. I ordered some pizza. Vegetarian with ham. The connoisseur's choice. Watched some Frasier reruns and then went to bed. I reckon I fell asleep within 10 minutes. Hey, wake up, fella. Don't ignore me. You're the only other person in this room. I was slow to wake up. Even slower to open my eyes. I was definitely in my room. In my bed, but there was another voice. There was somebody in my bedroom with me. Yeah, Doc. You ain't ignoring me, are ya? I was scared stiff. Literally. I tried to call out, but my throat wouldn't move. I could only take shallow breaths. My arms and legs were paralyzed. I was trapped. I didn't think anybody was holding me, I just couldn't move. This is way worse than when I'm waking up in the morning. Honest to God, sleep paralysis. I've only ever read about it in textbooks. My gaze shifted to my right where the moonlight shone through my bedroom window. There he was, Mr. Big Head. He looked like an ordinary man except for his giant head. It honestly looked like somebody had overinflated his head to a comical proportion and his facial features stayed stuck to the front. It would be funny if he hadn't invaded my home, and if I wasn't frozen still. You ain't going nowhere, Doc. And neither am I, you hear me? I don't want you talking to Johnny. I got a good thing going. A loving home. Do you know how hard those are to come by? Hard, Doc. Real hard. Why you gotta interfere in a good thing? Do you think you're helping people? By getting rid of me? I have a right to exist, you know. You ain't got a say in that. Don't you go getting rid of me. I'm a good guy. You just... You just leave me alone, you hear? Consider this a warning, Doc. I blinked. My arm threw the blanket across the room and fell on the floor. There was no apparition there. I was the only person in my bedroom. Just me, sitting up, gasping for breath. I couldn't believe what I think I witnessed. I took a child's imaginary friend and made it into a nightmare. That would be the only logical explanation. A man of science like me couldn't pretend that a human being with a giant-sized head can invade a home and then disappear. It betrays all reason. It simply can't happen. I'm a grown man, not a child. The power of suggestion is strong, but to this extreme is simply... unscientific. I turned the light on and sat at the edge of my bed. My conduct was unprofessional. I couldn't let my imagination run wild like this. To the point of a severe anxiety-induced nightmare. Or it's the chocolate. Maybe I just had to lay off the chocolate. I just laughed at myself alone sitting on my bed. I shook my head. Threw the blanket back on the end. With the lights on. The next day... John and Mary sat down on the couch without saying a thing. I looked at them, even though I was trying to be sensible, a proud professional, a source of comfort and safety with a deep breath I announced to them. I met Mr. Bighead. Tears welled in their eyes. We were all afraid of John's imaginary friend. Fifteen years ago, I took my boyfriend Kauji deep sea fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. 
There he caught the scariest thing I'd ever seen. We were living near Houston at the time, a land of heat, humidity, and too many sunburns. My boyfriend hadn't been fishing since he was a kid. He'd often reminisce about childhood trips with his Oji Chan to the oceanfront pier. We caught everything, Kauji said. Sheep shed, stingrays, even a sandbar shark once. It was over four feet long. We ate it that night. The meat tasted so sour. I could never get into fishing. It always made me feel queasy. So you trick these animals with the promise of food, I said. But then you tear them violently out of their home and kill them. True, but they don't go to waste. Kauji nudged my belly. You know that better than anyone. I laughed. Kauji had a point. Seafood was one of my dietary staples, the only meat I would consume. Whenever we went out to restaurants, I often ordered the mahi-mahi or salmon entree. On Kauji's 22nd birthday, I decided, after four years of hearing him reminisce about fishing, that I'd buy him a day trip as a present. So I went online and booked a private charter for that afternoon. Kauji's deep blue eyes lit up as we entered the marina. This is going to be great, he said, especially with my baby at my side. He pulled me in for a long, deep kiss. My stomach somersaulted. We took Dramamine, lathered on some SPF 50, and headed for the docks. Our charter was a 30-foot vessel named Kuda. It was a completely open boat with a center console. A small roof and two twin outboard motors at its stern that looked like giant black seahorses. A half dozen fishing poles were on board, along with a tackle box and a massive cooler of ice, which I thought was for drinks but was actually for fish. Our captain slash fishing guide was an elderly black man named Delroy Washington, tall, lean, and weathered. He'd spent over 20 years in the Merchant Marine before retiring to start his own fishing company. Delroy claimed he was a half-fish himself, born at sea many years ago. My mother plopped me out of her belly aboard a tramp steamer, headed across the Caribbean, he said chuckling. Kauji and I laughed, not really sure what he meant. So what do you want to catch? Delroy asked us. If you could catch anything, any fish in the world. I'm just here to take pictures, I told him, holding up my Canon DSLR. I was big into photography and scrapbooking at the time. Maybe photograph a sea turtle or some dolphins. Absolutely, no problem. Delroy turned to Kauji. How about you, birthday boy? Your better half told me you love to fish, so what's your dream catch? Kauji thought for a moment. You know, if I could catch anything, I think it'd be a Goliath grouper. I saw one at an aquarium once as a kid, as big as a mini cooper, he said. That fish could have swallowed me in one gulp. I had nightmares about it for weeks afterwards. It was so creepy, but so cool. Kauji loved monster fish, particularly those that lived in the deep. He was both scared and fascinated by them. Some might even say obsessed. It reminded me of how religious people are often both terrified and in awe of God. Ah, a Goliath. Delroy grinned. We'd have to do a catch and release, but I have just the place. He started the Kuda's engine. I'm going to take you to the best spot for bottom fishing in the whole world. Lots of big groupers there. We went 10 miles offshore to the site of a shipwreck that wasn't on any nautical charts, at least according to Delroy. It was a place he'd heard about from some old fishing buddies. Delroy gave us the rundown as we headed to our location. The wreck's a 600 foot long container ship named the Amphitrite. She sank during a tropical storm a few years back, returning to her home port in Houston. Captain sent out a brief distress call, then she disappeared from radar. When the storm ended, a big search party was launched, lasted for months. Finally they found her resting on her side in 250 feet of water. No survivors. 
Rumor has it the Amphitrite was carrying a high-value cargo from a pharmaceutical giant when she went down. They did a salvage operation to recover it, then left the ship on the bottom of the sea, where she's slowly turned into a reef. Great for fishing. Delroy stopped the engine and anchored the boat. You'll catch your Goliath for sure. The ocean was calm. I glanced overboard. You could see a long way down, but there was no sign of fish or the giant shipwreck that gave them shelter. Everything was hidden beneath a heavy blanket of dark blue. I felt a shiver crawl up my spine and backed away from the boat's railing. You'll need this to catch the monsters. Delroy handed Kauji a pole that was six feet long and as thick as a tree branch. It had a fat reel of line and a hook big enough to punch through a man's hand. Kauji used a dead squid as bait, letting it sink all the way to the bottom. It took a minute to get there, then we waited for the first bite. And waited, and waited, and waited. We spent god knows how long just staring at the open ocean. All the while, Kauji didn't receive the slightest nibble on his line. Our captain was shocked. This... this has never happened before. Delroy's son. He kept repositioning the boat over different sections of the wreck. You're going to get something, I promise. There are hundreds of fish down there. He showed us his Garmin Fish Finder. An underwater GPS for tracking sea life. Its screen was full of floating blobs that Delroy swore were monster fish just waiting to be caught. To me, they look like clumps of drifting seaweed. Kauji tried different baits. Live mackerel, colorful lures, trolling, but nothing worked. More hours passed. The boat bobbed up and down on the choppy water. Its surface was like a glass curtain rolling endlessly towards the horizon. I didn't see the promised sea turtles or dolphins, and to make matters worse, I started feeling seasick. Even though I'd taken Dramamine, a swell of nausea ballooned in the pit of my stomach, inching its way up to my throat like some slimy, prickly worm. It started slowly, then grew very strong, very fast. I ran to the side of the boat and vomited the remains of my breakfast burrito into the ocean. Sarah, are you alright? Kauji asked. It's okay. I told him. In truth, I wanted nothing more than to go home right then, but I felt so bad that Kauji hadn't caught any fish after years of wanting to go on a fishing trip. He looked so deflated. His shoulders hunched over. It's just a little seasickness. I'm fine now. I told him. But the slick queasiness was already starting to well up again. Maybe we could call today. Kauji said, sighing. He was about to set his fishing pole down when something big tugged on the line. Everyone froze, staring at the pole, wondering if its sudden movement was just a collection of delusion. Kauji started to crank the reel when there was another tug on the line. Set the hook, Delroy's son. Kauji yanked the rod upwards and the end of the pole violently bobbed up and down. Fishing line flew out of the reel so fast it made a screeching sound. Fish on, Delroy's son. You hooked your monster, birthday boy. He poured water onto the spinning reel to keep it from overheating. I still felt nauseous, but steeled myself from throwing up again. I didn't want to worry, Kauji, especially now that he finally had his birthday wish. It took nearly an hour for him to bring the fish up near the boat. At first, we just saw a dark shape roughly 50 feet below the surface. It kept darting further into the depths before anyone could get a good look at it. But whatever it was, it was huge. As big as a Mini Cooper, Kauji said, his eyes wide. Almost there. Keep taking in the slack, Delroy's son. Kauji was still reeling in excess line when the fish yanked so hard it nearly snapped the pole in half. Almost dragging him overboard. Jesus. Kauji said, grabbing hold of the guardrail. Are you okay? I rushed to his side. Kauji didn't respond. He didn't even look at me. His blue eyes were too focused on the depths below. 
He kept reeling in line. The fish was no longer fighting back. Look, Delroy said, pointing into the ocean. The dark shape was finally coming into focus. What was left of it? Kaoji finished reeling in his catch, then lifted it out of the water a foot from the edge of the boat. It was no fish. Hanging from the end of his line was a giant fleshy carcass, full of loose yellowish skin, pink organs, and various gummy substances that resembled red jello. The carcass had no discernible head or body, no eyes, no mouth, no bones. It was just lumps of skin and pink viscera, an animal that had been ripped apart by predators as it was dragged up from the deep. Even in a semi-consumed state, it was still huge. The living creature must have weighed over 400 pounds and had been at least 8 feet long when it was still alive. For some reason, the body smelled like fresh fruit. It was disgusting. I wanted to shut my eyes and throw up, but I couldn't look away. We spent a few moments staring at the carcass in silence when... What the hell? Kauji's son. I need to cut the line. Delroy angled for the pole. What is it? Kauji asked the captain. Is it a... a squid? Maybe a dolphin? Or a whale? I asked aloud. I raised my camera to take a picture, but... Delroy cut the line with a fillet knife. No, wait! The carcass dropped into the ocean with a heavy splash before I could take my picture. It quickly sank into the endless blue depths now, gone in seconds. Why'd you cut it loose so fast? What... what was that? I said. A piece of garbage from the wreck. Delroy said. Nothing worthwhile. He started to put the rod and reel away. What? I asked him, incredulous. That thing had clearly been alive. Delroy was suddenly on edge. We should get going. What's happening? I asked. Kauji wiped something on his arm. It looked like red jello. I think some of it splashed on me. He said. Hearing this, Delroy rushed over and handed him a wet rag. Use this. Wipe it all off. Then throw the towel overboard. We went straight back to the marina afterwards. Kauji spent most of the trip staring at the passing waves, while I interrogated Delroy for more information about what my boyfriend had caught. If that was trash, how could it move like that? Delroy remained focused on the boat's controls. Sometimes, big pieces of debris feel like live fish on the line because ocean currents tug at them. I found this hard to believe. Did that feel like dead weight or a live fish? I asked Kauji. I don't know. Kauji's son. He kept staring at the passing waves. I'd never seen him so quiet before. His skin was as pale as sea foam. Well, how come it looks so organic? I don't know. Delroy's son. But I didn't want to examine it further to find out. He knew a fisherman who'd caught similar debris at other wreck sites before. That stuff is often toxic, like medical waste. Delroy's son. Maybe Kauji hooked some fat deposit or something left over from the salvage operation. I frowned. The captain's explanation sounded like a cover. What was that container ship really carrying? I asked. You mean the amphitrite? Delroy stared at the horizon, thinking. Then he turned to me and shrugged. I didn't ask my buddies what it was carrying. All I needed to know was whether or not the fishing was good. And it was. Until today? I added. Delroy nodded. Our captain was tense the whole ride back. His fingers gripped the steering wheel. Why was he so certain we'd catch a monster fish at that wreck? Had he seen or heard of something like what Kauji had caught before? Maybe he even knew the potential for danger and was lying to save face. I wanted to ask more, but we'd arrived back at the marina and the captain was eager to get rid of us. You'll get a free trip. Two free trips. Delroy's son. Again, 
I am so, so sorry. Kauji and I thanked Delroy and told him that we'd think about it, but I already knew I'd never go out on the man's boat again. In fact, I never wanted to go fishing again. Not after what had happened. I don't think Kauji wanted to either. We had a quiet birthday dinner that night at our townhouse. Kauji seemed happy despite the day's lackluster trip. At least we have a great story to tell. That captain was lying, I said. Once we were on shore and had cell service again, I googled the Amphitrite. The most recent ship that was by that name was built in 1802 and sank in 1833. It's definitely not some modern container ship, I told him. Maybe he was confused, or he forgot the name, Kauji said. Who cares? What matters is we made it home safe. Yeah, I guess, I said. I wish I'd gotten a photo of it. It was probably just a dolphin, Kauji said, and some shark killed it as I was reeling it in. Delroy just didn't want to say it out loud because it would make him look bad. Think about it. A fishing charter that was responsible for killing a dolphin? No one would ever book him again. Yeah? I agreed, chuckling. But somehow that explanation didn't feel right either. That night, while Kauji and I were having sex, he suddenly pulled away. Do you want to go to the shower? He asked, nearly breathless. Uh, sure. I told him, a little pissed. I was just getting into it when he stopped. Kauji grabbed me by my arm and pulled me into the shower. I just need to feel wet right now, he said. I don't know why. We started to make out getting into it again, when Kauji suddenly turned the dial all the way to the left. Freezing cold water cascaded over our naked bodies. Ah, what the hell? I turned the dial to warm, but Kauji stopped me. No, it has to be cold. He said he opened his mouth wide, letting the icy water fill it up. I stepped out of the shower, wrapping a thick bathrobe around my freezing body. Is this some kind of a joke? Kauji just stood there in the icy shower, but he wasn't shivering. He actually seemed quite content. Comfortable, even. No, he said. But... But what? I asked, growing even more worried. Kauji started to fidget, his arms jerking spasmodically. Was he getting cold? I need more, he said, stepping out of the shower. When he brushed past me, his body felt like ice, like a dead fish. What are you talking about? Where are you going? No response. Kauji ran downstairs. I followed him. Maybe he was going to the kitchen for a warm drink, but when I got downstairs, Kauji wasn't in the kitchen, or the living room, or the foyer. Kauji? I called out. That's when I heard the sound of a car engine starting. I entered the garage and found my boyfriend behind the wheel of his car, still completely naked. Kauji! I screamed. I tried opening the driver's side door, but it was locked. I banged on the glass. What are you doing? Open the door, now! He finally looked at me, his expression pained. His face was turning blue like he was suffocating. Uh, I... I'm sorry. He stammered from behind the windshield. Those were the last words my boyfriend would ever say to me. Seconds later, Kauji put the car in reverse and backed down the driveway. He drove all the way to the shore that night. Kauji was last seen at the end of a long oceanfront pier, the same one he used to fish off with his grandfather. He was still naked. A few old men who were shark fishing on the pier spotted him. They saw Kauji stagger towards the railing, gasping for air. According to them, his face was purple like he was choking. When the fishermen approached to help, Kauji climbed onto the railing, then jumped off, disappearing into the cold, dark ocean 40 feet below. One fisherman said he was grinning like a kid as he slammed into the waves. The Coast Guard conducted a months-long search afterwards. 
They found no sign of Kaoji, not even a body. He was officially pronounced dead later that year. Cause of death? Drowning. I didn't feel sad, not for a long time. I was angry at first, then confused, then angry again, then mystified. I had days long crying spells. Kaoji and I were supposed to get married. We'd talked about the life we would build together, about having lots of children and moving to a small shack on the beach. Why would he throw it all away, and in such a dramatic fashion? Mostly, I just felt numb. At his funeral, Kaoji's parents told me they were suing Delroy and his fishing charter company. They believed their son was poisoned by the debris he'd caught that day, that it had caused some sort of nervous breakdown that made him... off himself. It was a theory I shared as well, although I wasn't sure how it could be proven. I shuddered to think of someone going back out to the wreck to study the strange and toxic things that lay below the surface. I later heard the family sued the shipping company that owned Amphiterite, too. There was some large cash settlement, I think. I'm not sure. By that point, I just wanted to move on from the whole thing. Years passed, I moved to the Arizona desert. Living near the sea was just too triggering. I got a job at a tech company in Phoenix. Met a tan football coach named Mark. We got married had two bright and beautiful kids. I'd almost forgotten about Kaoji and that fateful fishing trip until last week on a family vacation to Hawaii. While staying in Waikiki, Mark wanted to go trawling for billfish, as he put in. It was something he hadn't done in years, long before we were married. I was supposed to learn he was such an avid fisherman. Of course I was reluctant. Anytime I went in the ocean after Houston, I got this strange, uneasy feeling. Like I was being watched. For the longest time, I told people I couldn't even swim. And then I moved to the middle of the desert, hundreds of miles away from any large body of water. But seeing the absolute joy on my kids' faces changed my mind. Okay, I said. Let's go. Surely it couldn't be that bad. I never told my husband about Kaoji, much less his passing. I like to think the reason why was because I'd forgotten about it, but in truth I was too worried the story would make him second guess our relationship. The whole incident was just so surreal, too surreal to be believable. I kept wondering how I would appear in his eyes after I told him, if he would still love me. We went a few miles offshore of Honolulu. It was another private charter, but this time on a fancy 50-foot yacht, so I felt somewhat safer. The boat kept moving, dragging a series of colorful lures in its wake. Mark and the kids were hoping to catch a marlin or a wahoo. Anything big and exciting. They were all holding on to different fishing poles. Once again, I was just along for the ride, carrying my trusty camera. An iPhone, this time. I was ready to photograph anything they caught. A few minutes into the trip, Mark hooked something big. His line started screeching, going out a mile a minute. The captain poured water over the reel to keep it cool. Fish on, he said. Mark fought the fish for nearly an hour, gradually bringing it closer and closer to the boat. The kids had their cell phones out, recording everything. Mark said it felt like a giant tuna on the line. He looked so happy. Even I was lost in the excitement at that moment. After some time, the fish started to tire out. Mark had almost reeled it in when a huge wave rocked the boat. Everyone fell to the deck, even the captain. Mark dropped his fishing pole. I was the first to get up, and I was helping my children to their feet. I happened to glance overboard. That's when I saw it. A giant shape glided silently beneath the waves, hooked at the end of Mark's fishing line. It had a massive, sleek body, at least ten feet long and covered in pinkish-yellow skin. Fins and tentacles jutted from its sides, and a sharp fish hook pierced its scaly cheek, drawing blood. Strangest of all, the creature had a human head. 
His pained eyes looked into mine, and in that moment I felt overwhelming fear, but also tremendous awe, like a religious fervor. Moments before anyone else could see it, I cut the fishing line, and Kauji disappeared into the watery depths below. Last week, I had the bright idea to fish out my dad's old radio from the attic. I somehow managed to intercept a distress call. Today, I tried to return home only to find the roads closed off. I wiped off years of dust and slowly lowered it down the creaking steps. Pulling it into my living room, I couldn't help but marvel at the vintage wooden casing along with its intricate brass detailing. I made sure everything was still in working order as I turned the knobs, hearing them click as they went. The radio crackled to life, encasing the room in a warm, fuzzy sound. I was ready to go, sifting through station after station. The usual came through at first, all sorts of music genres, ads, local news, and above all, the radio preachers. I kept at it for a few minutes, remembering how my dad and I used to always do this on the weekends when he didn't have work. I would be sitting right next to him listening in. It was our thing. Every weekend without fail. I suppose the extra time I had today reminded me of it. It was almost comforting hearing the sound of static flooding my living room once I hit an empty channel. At least I thought it was empty until a woman's voice came through. This is Dr. Emily Davis, lead scientist of the research team stationed at Emerald Bay. We are broadcasting this message to hopefully warn at least a few people. Our comm system has gone dark. The situation is dire. I believe we have started something we can't stop. It paused momentarily, overtaken again by static. I was questioning if what I just heard was real or not. I know that sometimes there are storytelling programs, but her voice was so full of emotion. Of fear. Not to mention Emerald Bay was a small island about 30 miles off the coast from my home, just barely inside the range of this radio. I sat up to change the channel, but before I could grab the dial, her voice broke through again. Operation Starfall. It was a success. The dimensional displacement engine worked as intended, but I believe our coordinates were off somehow. We have connected with some place that definitely isn't the parallel Earth we came in contact with the first time. What we connected to this time seems to be a realm of complete darkness. There is another problem. Upon breach into this other place, a shockwave swept throughout the facility which damaged our comms along with other electrical systems. Luckily, the old broadcasting radio is still somewhat functional. If our contractors are listening, we need assistance immediately. Something has tethered itself to the gate, and is stopping the system from closing it. Our sensors have also been picking up additional movement beyond the gate for the last 30 minutes since it opened. We have been forced to recognize the idea that something may be trying to come through. With what we have available, I fear we won't be able to stop it. We have decided that igniting the remaining fuel, which will hopefully take the machine out along with it. This has to be done manually. And as the lead scientist, I will be the one to stay back to accomplish this task. The others have already loaded onto the boat, and are heading back to shore. I've gathered the proper equipment needed, and will proceed with igniting the... What cut her off was something I couldn't even begin to describe. Some sort of low groan, which even to me in my living room was deafening. Sweat was beating off my forehead. If this was indeed a radio show, it was one worthy of an Oscar. Something has breached the gate, I repeat. The gate has been breached. Some kind of dark, writhing mass is pulling its way out into the station. I'm going to ignite the fuel now. I, I've opened the valve to dump the remaining fuel out into the room. That same noise interrupted her again, louder this time. The noise settled deep into my bones, a primal fear erupting inside me, causing me to instinctively backpedal from the radio. 
Jesus Christ, what the hell are you? If anyone's listening, please be prepared to evacuate the area. If our contractors can hear this, we need armed assistance now. I don't know if this will stop it. God help us. Her voice was coming off in the distance this time, but as the last sentence escaped her lips, a loud boom reverberated out through the speakers followed by the radio returning back to its original fuzzy crackle. This time I wasn't greeted some comforting sense as before. Instead, I was left sitting all alone in my living room shaking from what I had just heard. As if on cue, two large helicopters flew over my house and off into the distance. I spent the next half hour trying to calm down. I don't know what was worse. The anxiety that came from not knowing what happened, or the feeling of being a fool for letting some stupid radio show get me this worked up. I was praying it was the latter. My afternoon was spent cleaning and doing odd jobs around my house. No matter how hard I scrubbed the dishes, or how many windows I shined, I couldn't get her voice out of my head. What if it was real? What if she didn't stop it, and whatever crawled out of that abyss was making its way here right now? I knew I was just being paranoid. I had to be. The same thing happens when I spend too much time watching the news convincing myself Armageddon is upon us. I needed a drink. An old bottle of scotch I had shoved to the back of the cabinet sufficed. Sitting down with a hefty glass and some old cartoons ought to do the trick. Childish, I know. I flipped mindlessly through the channels trying to find something when the local weather appeared. I paused for a moment as I checked in. The headline was, Freak Storm Coming Off, Redacted, Coast. Then they showed the radar, and I watched in horror as I realized where the storm came from. Smack right down in the center was a small green dot surrounded by blue. Emerald Bay. That was a week ago. I left my house as soon as I saw it. Sure enough, as I loaded into my rickety pickup, just barely visible over the horizon, there it was. A cloud so black it seemed to absorb the lights around it. I don't think I've ever driven that fast in my life. Today I finally ran out of the emergency fund that was paying for my hotel room. I tried looking online to see if my home was safe to return to. The thing is, I couldn't find a single article about my coastal village, like it had been wiped from existence. How do you get rid of an entire town's online presence in a week? I had to go see for myself. I know it probably wasn't the greatest idea, but it was either that, or plan out how I was going to survive in my truck with a broken heater. I drove the hour stretch of road to get back to my home. Before I could reach it, however, I came upon a roadblock. Blacked out SUVs with no identifiable organization plastered on. Same with the people with rifles slung over their backs. I asked them if what was going on had anything to do with what I heard over the radio. They didn't answer my question and told me a train car had derailed with dangerous chemicals on board. Why does a chemical spill warrant soldiers with guns? I asked if I could at least get my things from my home, but I was denied. I had no choice but to turn away. As I was leaving, I peered back through my mirror to see the soldiers pile into two of the three SUVs and tear out in the opposite direction. I got back to my hotel and launched myself onto my bed, defeated. At least I don't think I'll have to worry about paying for another night at this hotel, because just a few minutes ago, I heard that same low, thunderous groan I heard over the radio. March 6th, 2017. I was sitting alone in my room. It was a particularly normal evening at the start, all things considered. The fan I always had on was spinning at its normal speed. Its undusted blades whirring like the faint buzz of a mosquito flying right next to your ear for a split second. 
The white, bleak light stained my room in what I considered to be the worst possible lighting condition for photos. Anytime I made a project for my digital media class, I had to take the photos outside, and of course, my sink, dripping water ever so lightly. It was noticeable enough to where I could hear it, but too insignificant to call a plumber. Not that they'd fix it anyway. The rain began soon after sunset. It pounded against my window, and every so often the wind would pick up enough to lift the attic door a little, making a slam sound each time the wind died down. There I was, flipping my way through one of my favorite books, Ready Player One. It was a little bit of an old book by that point. I had bought it when it first released, but that book never failed to strike me in some way each time I read it. I was halfway through the second set of chapters when I heard a knock at the door. I didn't think anything of it, since large objects slammed against the door when the winds picked up this much. After a second, though, I heard it again, and I started to worry. Who could be out there at this hour, especially with all this weather? I began descending the stairs towards my front door. I figured it was some underpaid Amazon delivery driver waiting to drop off his last package. I did choose to have me sign the package at the door after some package thievery in the neighborhood, so it wasn't unlikely, but then again, I don't remember ordering any packages. I brushed the thought off and began to turn the handle. Then all of a sudden, I stopped. Something felt wrong. If I hadn't ordered a package, then that meant it was most likely a beggar or a missionary of some kind. I took my hand off the handle, leaving the door shut. Then the knock pounded again. Harder this time. This person clearly wasn't here for a drink. I grabbed my shotgun and loaded it. The state I lived in was a stand-your-ground state, meaning you could defend yourself at your own free will if an unwanted presence was on your property. If this person tried to break in, I could legally shoot them regardless. Knowing this gave me comfort, because the area was so crime-heavy. As I chambered one of the shells, the knock pounded one last time this time being one of the hardest knocks I had ever heard. I broke into a cold sweat. Grabbing the trigger, I kicked down the door and... Standing at my door was a little boy, his face hidden in his coat. I lowered my shotgun to my waist and put my hand on his shoulder. You alright? I inquired. He didn't respond. Come on, get inside. I ushered him in with little resistance. Closing my door, I turned to the kitchen. Come, let's get you some warm hot chocolate. The boy lowered his hood. He was on the younger side, around seven or eight. He had dirty blonde hair and diamond blue eyes, and the facial expression of a ghost. He stared blankly at me for a few seconds, then walked towards the couch and sat down. Whatever has this boy been through, I thought to myself. I put a hot chocolate pot into the coffee maker and began to run it, an extra large cup in it and a reasonably sized straw not too far from the coffee maker. I walked towards the boy and crouched, his eyes still. What's your name? I asked. What were you doing out there in the rain? Again, no response, but his gaze broke and he looked towards the window. Lifting his finger, he slowly pointed towards the house across the street. Maybe my neighbors were his parents, I thought. I turned back to look at him, but his gaze was back on me, his eyes almost colder, like I had done something to displease him. I jumped up in surprise, then shook myself out of it. Then I fully understood. As I did, the coffee maker finished, and I went to grab the hot chocolate. When I returned, the boy was gone, and my door was wide open. Nothing was missing, so he hadn't stolen anything, but he was just... gone. I walked up to the door, but he was completely gone, like he had vanished into thin air. The house across the street didn't even have a light on. It was around that hour anyways. Then I felt a tap on my shoulder. I froze. I didn't know what was behind me, but whatever it was, 
I knew it wasn't human. The skin that tapped me was ice cold, almost like an icicle stabbing into my shoulder. I reached for my gun slowly, and as I did, I felt another ice-cold hand grab my shoulder and begin to pull me away. Immediately, I kicked backwards, feeling something soft be pushed away and the hand flying off my shoulder. I picked up my gun and keys and ran to my car. I heard a scream as I got into the car, and as I started the ignition, it jumped into my view from nowhere. Then I got a glimpse of it. Its skin was a pale white. Its arms and legs and fingers were all abnormally long, longer than any human was capable of growing. I slammed my car into drive and rammed it, not looking to see if it was dead. I drove out my driveway and turned onto my neighborhood road and ran, not looking back until I had made it almost six miles out. Still out of breath, I pulled over and stepped out of my car. Looking around, I noticed there wasn't a single car on the road like it had been abandoned. The rain pit patted against the gravel, and the flickering light hummed loudly. I sat down my shotgun and slept in the car, the window wide open to let the cold night air in. I waited until almost noon the next day to go back to my house. I spent my morning hours calling every local wildlife company and police department I could think of. I even drove to the gun shop and bought another box of shells for safekeeping, because I really wished I had used them. When I arrived back, my door was open, and cones and yellow tape covered my driveway. A corpse outline was painted onto my driveway, and the flash of sirens lit up the sides of my house in a corporate red and blue. The police said that last night, the body was found in my driveway, and they wanted to have me take a look to see if I knew who it was. As they opened the bag, my eyes widened. There, in the bag, was the boy from the previous night. I didn't recognize it at first, but when I did, I sank. I didn't run over the boy. I ran over its replacement... thing. I told the cops I didn't know what happened and they let me off scot-free. As I walked into my house, I set the box of shells down and began to walk to my bedroom. As I opened the door, I noticed my mirror was stained with blood, and I had to use a shirt to wipe it off. As I looked into it, I noticed something behind me. I turned around and saw my wall, painted with brown, old blood, the last thing I wanted to see. Something that made me realize that the previous night wasn't a dream or a drug-induced hallucination. Something that made me sick to my stomach. There, written on the wall, You're a coward, Mr. Cohen. Don't neglect your dental hygiene, kids. I wish I'd taken that advice when I was young. Growing up, I lived on soda and snacks. I guess a lot of kids did, but I'd go through a 12-pack of Coke in a single day sometimes. My parents tried their best to sway me in the right direction, but you know how kids can be with their sweets. So naturally, I ended up with cavities. Awesome. So I went to the dentist, as one does in such a situation. They did some drilling and filling, the whole nine yards, and that sent me on my way. Problem solved. For now. Well, years later, I got new insurance and hit up a new dentist as a result. He discovered that at least two of the fillings his predecessor billed me for were bogus. There was no evidence of decay there at all. They were just taking advantage of a kid with a sweet tooth to bilk some extra money out of the family. This led to me, as you can imagine, a deep mistrust of the dental profession outside of the doctor. So once the kindly old man who ran the office retired, I just stopped going to dentists altogether. I did not, however, stop drinking excessive amounts of soda. Eventually, that caught up with me. It was time to face up to years. Actually, near a decade of neglect. 
I found a new local dentist who had good reviews. I had to have several extractions, a handful of root canals, numerous fillings. It was painful and expensive and I hated my younger self with a burning passion. But hey, my suffering was over. It'd just take some time for the gums to heal over and I'd be all good. There was one sore spot in particular where one of my back teeth had been badly infected and subsequently plucked out of its socket. But the dentist assured me that was normal and it would itch and ache for a bit then go back to normal as the socket healed over. But the itching just kept getting more intense. It was unbearable. I couldn't exactly scratch it. I applied layer after layer of aura gel to numb the pain, but nothing worked. I was going mad. I had begun drinking heavily just to dull the agony, which was something I swore I'd never do after what happened to my uncle, but I didn't know where else to turn but to the bottle. And then one morning, I awoke from yet another drunken stupor to the unmistakable taste of copper, blood pouring from my mouth. The itchy socket had burst open. I ran my thumb along my gum line and sure enough... Wait... What the hell? I felt a tooth crowning out of the stitches. I'm... 34. I lost my baby teeth decades ago, but between the pain and the vodka, I couldn't really process what was happening. I just haphazardly wiped up the blood, downed a few more Tylenol, and went back to Ben. So, here's the fun part. I was traveling for work that day, so I was nowhere near the only dentist I trusted. But this was bad. I needed to be seen immediately. I googled around a bit, found one that didn't look too terrible in the Tucson area, and popped by for an emergency visit. I waited a bit, clutching my jaw in pain and was eventually taken back for an x-ray. They found that, impossibly, my decaying, cracked molar was potentially awaiting extraction. I... I just had that removed last week. I uttered in confusion. Smelling the alcohol on my breath, the x-ray tech shook his head. I don't know what to tell you, Mr. Harvey. I can see you've had extensive work done, so you're probably just confused. But you can clearly see the tooth right here in this printout. That's impossible. And yet, there it is. You're gonna want that bad boy out before the infection gets worse. I have an opening this afternoon. Piss off. He was scamming me just like the first dentist. I was sure of him. I'd pop some more pills for the duration of my trip and wait until I got home to see my usual dentist. He stopped me with a firm yet gentle hand on my shoulder. He calmly explained that if I didn't get the tooth removed, the infection could spread and cause a litany of other health issues up to and including death. He procured a few mirrors to show me the physical tooth and demonstrate that there was no trickery in the x-ray. Fine. Insurance wouldn't cover it, but it hurt like hell and I didn't want to risk it spreading. Maybe I really was mixing it up with a different tooth I'd had removed. Dr. W had removed five teeth total, and I had been drinking a lot. I guess it's not out of the question. Except, a few days after my recovery, I felt that same itching sensation again, and this time I felt it in one of the other empty sockets as well. And this time, they were... pulsing. I clenched my teeth reflexively, which was a mistake. I felt my upper tooth dig into the lower one as my jaw tightened. It squished in and then made an audible pop. I gagged as my mouth was flooded with an earthly tasting goop. I spat it out in surprise, costing my keyboard in thick, greenish sap. What the hell? And are those seeds suspended in the liquid? I grasped my jaw in pain and confusion. I could feel the roots of my tooth writhing and squirming in my gums. The now familiar taste of blood mingled with the sap, forming an absolutely disgusting frothing solution in flavor, texture, and appearance. Beneath it all, I felt the next tooth emerging from its post-surgical socket. 
I rinsed my mouth with mouthwash as best I could and gently prodded it with a Q-tip. Sure enough, this one was hard to the touch, but I felt something give underneath the enamel coating. At this point, panic had set in and completely sobered me up. I felt the sap-filled pustules growing underneath enamel shells throughout my mouth. I screamed, I vomited, I passed out. I don't really know what happened next. I woke up in a hospital-style bed at an unfamiliar dentist's office. I hazily looked around but didn't see anyone. I flicked my tongue around my mouth. Maybe it was all a dream. To my horror, I found a nearly completely empty gum line across my entire lower jaw, and a handful more were missing from the roof as well. Uh, good morning. You were in a pretty bad accident, I'd wager. Not sure what happened, but when your roommate brought you in, there wasn't much to work with. We saved what we could, but, well, I'm here to take a cast for partial dentures. Said the stern dentist, presumably responsible for tearing out all of those god knows what's from my mouth. I couldn't say much in response due to the pain and the swabs of cotton in my mouth. I just moaned a little. I had so many questions, but couldn't utter a word. He took the cast, applying excruciatingly painful pressure to the afflicted sockets with his mold. I'm so sorry, he added as he left, almost as an afterthought. He noted that they'd call in a few weeks once the casting was completed, and to avoid chewing in the meantime. Sure, I'd definitely be chewing with the half dozen teeth I have left if he hadn't said that. I went home and drank myself to sleep yet again. I'd given up hope. Honestly, I was about ready to take my own life. Then I woke up with a full mouth of teeth again. I'm afraid to chew on them. I can feel the roots squirming and growing beneath the hard shell. I don't know where these things came from or why. I don't know if they're dangerous. Hell, I don't even know if it's worse to pop them open or let them fester. But I feel the roots burrowing deeper and deeper into my skull in the meantime. And one question dominates my mind now. What happens if they reach my brain? Thursday, February 16th. This morning I awoke violently to the most dreadful sound I've ever heard. An ear-splitting screech echoed through the hull of my boat, and the vessel came to an abrupt stop. Quickly I crawled out of bed and tried to gather my bearings. As I exited the bedroom, my feet were greeted by a cold splash. I looked down to see the entire floorboard covered in an inch-deep carpet of seawater. Flurries of thoughts raced through my mind and I began to fear the worst. As I wondered whether or not I had struck a reef, my eyes caught a glimpse of something sharp and rusty poking out of the wall of the starboard sign of the saloon. It was some kind of metal spike, roughly three inches in diameter. It was about chest height and had obviously impaled the hull. Water flooded in from the small openings between the spike and the hull in rhythm with the waves as they crashed into the boat. The pulsating water was reminiscent of gushing blood erupting from a severed artery. I rushed over to my utility closet, splashing through the water as I scuffled across the cabin. There, I began frantically rummaging through the unorganized mess of the various tools and supplies I had gathered over the years. As I searched, I could feel the water level slowly rising. I imagined the boat as an hourglass and the water as sand. Each grain of sand that poured in through the hull only led me closer and closer to an untimely burial at sea. When I had finally located what I was looking for, I hurried over to the spike. There I began sealing the cracks with waterproof tape reinforced with some kind of fast drying putty. Due to the sheer size of the spike, I wasn't able to remove it completely, though I wouldn't if I could either. The spike served as a blockade, and without it, the cabin would have been flooded in mere seconds. I'm sure you've heard that you should never pull out a knife from a stab wound, 
This is because the knife aids in sealing up the wound, preventing even more blood from pouring out. Well, the same concept applies here. Thankfully, stopping the leakage proved to be no challenge, but now that things have quieted down, I am beginning to realize that my problems aren't over just yet. I'm in the middle of the Atlantic, weeks away from the nearest continent, and I am stuck here for the foreseeable future. I went up to the deck immediately after sealing up the leak, and I discovered that the spike is actually attached to a greater structure that runs deep beneath the ocean's surface. It almost seems to be some kind of large metal spire. It's covered in rust and barnacles, and a great portion of it rises several feet above the water. It has four sharp spikes protruding from each side, one of which is the one that has pierced my hull. I will investigate further tomorrow. Friday, February 17th. I spent the remainder of yesterday hauling flood water out of the cabin. It took me several hours to accomplish, but at least it's dry down there again. Mostly, anyway. I have also furled up all the sails on the boat, and they will remain so indefinitely unless I somehow manage to get free from the spire without a hitch, which I highly doubt. This was done so that the spike wouldn't tear open the hull again with a powerful gust of wind hits the sails. As for the spire, I am no closer to understanding what it is or why it's there. I hopped in for a swim this morning in order to better survey the structure. And as soon as I breached the surface, an overwhelming sensation of dread overcame me. I have lived by the sea my entire life, and have never been affected by thalassophobia before. But seeing how deep that structure descended into the dark and murky depths below sent shivers up my spine. I don't quite know how to explain it, but the whole situation felt strange. Yes, I am aware that the structure itself is inherently an anomaly, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I felt this sort of low hum radiating through the body as I swam, and all of a sudden I felt exposed, paranoid that something would emerge from the deep and drag me down with it. I looked down and through my swimming goggles, stared into the blue abysmal ocean depths, and I swear I could feel something staring back at me. Needless to say, I quickly got back on the boat after that. I think it will be a while before I dare enter the ocean again. Friday, February 17th. Entry number two. After my morning swim with the spire, I began attempting to establish contact with emergency services. I didn't think I would need to write another entry for today, but a couple of strange things have been happening. So I reckon it is for the best if I document everything moving forward. Firstly, radio signals seem to be wavering. Whenever I try to communicate over the airwaves, I get in return only a chorus of static with some barely intelligible chatter scattered in there somewhere. I also have an extremely weak internet connection, but considering how frail it is, I might as well be offline. I have broadcasted an SOS signal multiple times now, but I'm unsure if it has actually reached anybody or not. If someone is indeed coming, it would take about a week or two to reach me, depending on what kind of ship they're using. Hopefully my rescuers will arrive by way of aircraft, because I'm not terribly confident that my makeshift plug will last more than a few days at best, and I would hate to one morning wake up on the bottom of the ocean. I will spend the rest of my evening trying to reach the mainland, but as it stands, I don't have high hopes. I will admit, my circumstances are beginning to look more dire with each passing second, and I am starting to become increasingly worried that I will actually perish out here. Saturday, February 18th. I woke up to a small leak today, but I managed to seal it up with relative ease. I still haven't heard back from any emergency services, and the radio is no different today than it was yesterday. Contemplating my options, I sat on the deck basking in the lukewarm mid-Atlantic's morning sun when I heard a strange sound. It sounded like a faint splash, 
sticking out from the calm ocean ambience like a sore thumb. Instinctively, I looked down, searching for the source of the sound. I scanned the azure waters without finding anything at first, and I was ready to give up when I laid my eyes on a peculiar stream of bubbles rising to the surface. As they breached the water, the signature splashing sound could be heard. Momentarily satisfied that I managed to locate the noise, I began pondering what it could actually be. I'd never seen anything like it before. Sure, I've seen bubbles before in my ten years of sailing, but this was different. Before I had the chance to come up with a plausible explanation, they suddenly disappeared. Puzzled, I stared out into the blue expanse, looking for any trace of what could have caused them. Then I heard a familiar sound a little to my left. As I turned my head, I once again saw the focused stream of bubbles rising to the surface. Only this time, it was closer to the stern. I walked across the deck and resumed studying the strange phenomena. The bubbles were too far away from the boat for it to be the cause, and the only other explanation for what it could be that I could think of was a passing submarine, or perhaps a hydrothermal vent, although it looked to be neither. Before I had the chance to reach a satisfying conclusion, the bubbles perpetually increased in size and ferocity, and it was as if that particular point in the ocean had all of a sudden turned into a raging jacuzzi. The bubbles erupted from the surface and spewed water everywhere, and I felt a few droplets trickle down my forehead. But just as suddenly as they had appeared, they vanished without a trace and the ocean was put in an eerie state of tranquility. Dumbfounded, I stood there in silence, wondering if what I had just seen had just occurred, or if it was just a figment of my imagination. I got my answer pretty quickly, though, as I spotted movement writhing beneath the waves. I leaned forwards on the railing, intently inspecting the strange object that was emerging from deep below me. As it got closer... Reflective shades of a greenish-white began to shimmer in the sunlight. As the creature surfaced, a quizzical grimace contoured across my face, and I was left with more questions than answers. With its belly up, the fish lifelessly rose to the top of the water. It looked to be a standard Atlantic herring, a small silver-colored fish that has provided me with many excellent meals during my time at sea but seeing it just turn up dead like that made me feel uneasy. Surely it must have been connected to those strange bubbles, right? As I contemplated grabbing my net and fishing it out of the sea, I spotted movement in the corner of my eye. I turned around to see another herring, mere feet away from the first, also floating lifelessly in the water. Then another one surfaced a short distance away, followed by another and then yet another. The eerie sight made my jaw drop to the floor and I stood there perplexed, just watching the dozens of dead fish floating on the waves. I still can't wrap my head around how or why that happened. As I said, the mysterious stream of bubbles must have been responsible in some way, but how? I wish I had an adequate internet connection so that I can google it or something. As for the rest of the day, nothing remarkable happened. I have decided to spend the remainder of the evening inside the cozy confines of the cabin, as I feel a bit apprehensive about staying out on deck now, especially after dark. First the spire, and now this. I don't know, something just feels a bit odd. Can't wait to get out of here. Sunday, February 19th. I have no idea how I didn't notice them before. While preparing breakfast in the galley, I glanced over to the thick spike still pierced through the hull. I routinely inspected for leaks when my eyes caught a strange pattern engraved on the rusty surface. I put down my sizzling frying pan and walked over to investigate. Upon closer examination, I could faintly make out a series of strange patterns and symbols. They look to be runes of some kind. I ripped out a page from this very logbook, placed it on top of the icons, and started tracing them with a pencil. 
Once finished, I was left with four otherworldly symbols. Two of them look like a hashtag coupled with tiny spirals scattered about, and the remaining two are way too intricate and detailed for me to even be able to attempt to describe. This only made me more curious as to what the purpose and origins of the spire truly are. How deep does it descend? What lies at the bottom? What does it do? These were all questions I vowed to answer, and so I came up with a plan to do so. I'm in my late 20s. I used to work part-time as an assistant oceanographer. One of the projects I worked on required us to use these specialized deep-sea cameras to chart the bottom of a trench right by the southern coast of Argentina. These cameras were able to withstand immense pressure, up to 500 atmospheres to be exact. It also just so happens that I own one of these cameras, though I haven't used it in close to half a decade. Hopefully, it will still turn on. If it doesn't, I'll just abandon the idea. My plan is to attach the recording camera to a rope and lower it to the seafloor next to the spire, in hopes that I may come closer to understanding this enigmatic structure once and for all. As I'm writing this, I just noticed some water spilling into the cabin, so I'll have to take care of that first. But after that, I'll spend the rest of the day preparing the equipment for the abysmal descent. Hopefully, I can get things ready and going by noon. If not, I'll postpone the expedition until tomorrow morning. Sunday, February 19th, entry number 2. Thank god the camera still worked. I spent close to an hour tweaking and modifying it, restoring it to its full functionality once more. Under normal circumstances, it is possible to view the camera feed live through the use of a computer, and even make real-time movements and zoom-ins with it, but for some reason the computer is unable to maintain a steady connection with the camera for longer than a minute before everything cuts to static, so I opted for a more traditional method. The plan was to set the camera to record, and then manually lower it to the sea floor. There, I'll let it sit for a couple of minutes before reeling it back to the surface. After that, I'll connect it to the computer and review the footage. Hopefully I will get clear imaging even though I can't control it remotely. And so I did just that. I tied a strong nylon rope around the camera and securely fastened it. I have a near endless supply of ropes and cords in my utility closet, so I was never worried about running out of depth. I picked up the equipment and went up on deck. It was the middle of the afternoon, but I still had a couple of hours left of sunlight. I tied the other end of the rope to the sailing of the boat, and I set the camera to record. As I walked up to the starboard side, Right next to where the spire breached the surface of the water, I stared down into the cold depths below. The ocean somehow seemed darker today, coated in an unnerving veil of inky black. I shuddered for a moment and then felt relief in the fact that it was only the camera that would get submerged, and not myself. I double-checked to see if everything was still working as intended, and then I carefully lowered the camera into the water. I watched as it slowly faded from view, sinking deeper and deeper into the abyss. It was an eerie sight. As I kept on lowering the camera, I pictured all the things that could be down there. I imagined an abundance of rare deep sea fish and creepy crustaceans, with uncomfortably long limbs. You know, the sorts of things one would expect populating the ocean floor your typical anglerfish and horseshoe crabs, maybe even a giant squid if I was lucky. But then I wondered what else would be down there, what unnatural sights would greet me as the camera reached the base of the spire, what was at the bottom, Atlantis, Rapture, mermaids? I'm not sure how long I stood there, endlessly lowering hundreds upon hundreds of feet of rope down into the murky sea. I glanced up and watched as the sun was beginning to set on the horizon, painting everything in a serene orange hue, and then I felt the rope go limp as if the camera had finally reached the seafloor. A jolt of excitement coursed through me, 
And I actually felt a bit nervous. In my mind, I pictured what the camera was looking at this very moment, and soon, I would be able to view it as well. I let it sit on the bottom for a couple of minutes before I began the tedious task of reeling it back up. Things were going well until I suddenly felt a bit of resistance while pulling. I looked down and observed a strange abundance of bubbles rising to the surface, similar to the bubbles I had seen only a couple of days prior. I thought it strange but continued as usual. But then to my utter shock and horror, the rope began violently tugging, the same way a fishing rod does once you've caught something big. I was completely perplexed and I began panicking. I strained my arms and desperately tried to resist, but whatever force was pulling the other end of the rope was way stronger than me. The tugging became so violent that I had to let go of the rope out of fear of rope burn. I watched helplessly as more and more rope flew over the edge of the boat and disappeared into the water. Whatever it was kept dragging the camera further away from the boat. Soon there wouldn't be enough rope left, and it would start tugging on the boat's railing. Would it break the railing, or maybe, as absurd as it seems, start dragging the boat under? I couldn't chance it. I rushed downstairs into the cabin and grabbed the first knife I could find. I hurried back up and began severing the knot that was tied around the starboard side railing. Beside me, I could hear the sound of rope rapidly flying overboard with each passing second. A wave of relief washed over me as the knife cut the last fiber of the knot, releasing its grasp on the boat. Though it was regrettable that I had just lost my expensive deep sea camera equipment, I was just happy to be out of harm's way. The last piece of rope sank into the ocean, and a sudden sense of serenity was cast across the waves. Everything was quiet, and the sun was setting. Cautiously, I moved toward the edge, once more staring into the hostile world below, and I questioned the events prior. My mind raced to come up with a logical explanation, but I fell short. Had a shark accidentally swallowed the camera? The force seemed a bit excessive for it to be a shark, and why would it move so fast and violently if it did? A great sadness fell upon me as I realized I would never be able to see the astonishing footage the camera had recorded, and the mysteries of the spire would forever remain unanswered, if only I had been able to view it live. As I'm writing this entry, I realize that I am left with a newfound fear of the ocean now. Everything that has been happening these past few days has warped my perception of what used to be a place of happiness for me. Had the events of today even occurred, it all feels so surreal, so implausible. I think it's best that I go to bed now. It's been a rough day, but as the boat rocks up and down on the waves, I will lay in my bed and imagine the abyss and the creatures that lurk just out of reach below me. Good night. Monday, February 20th. More dead fish floated up to the surface today. At least 50 by my count. I'm apprehensive about cooking them out of fear that whatever caused their demise might still remain in their flesh as a toxin or something. The last thing I need is food poisoning, or worse. I have also had a few strange sightings of something circling the boat. The first time I saw it was this morning when I sat on the deck, doing maintenance on some lines that had twisted. I heard a kind of blowing sound, reminiscent of when a whale or dolphin surfaces to take a breath. I quickly turned around just as the culprit fully submerged itself. I wasn't able to get a clear view, but I saw a dark shadow disappear beneath the waves. Initially, I suspected it may have been an orca, and this got me a bit anxious as killer whales have been known to attack sailboats on multiple occasions. I continued working, but remained vigilant. The next and last sighting happened in the afternoon. Just as the sun was beginning its descent on the horizon, it had been a very humid day, and as a result, a thick layer of fog rested on top of the water. I was inspecting the peculiar weather phenomena when I initially spotted it. Way off in the distance, maybe a mile out in the ocean, 
I saw a dark circular shape poke out of the water, still as a statue. Thinking it may have been debris at first, strained my eyes to properly gauge what I was looking at. Glistening rays of light penetrated through the thick haze from above, and I saw the light bounce off the wet objects, along with two reflective dots that stared right back at me. And then, whatever it was blinked. The whole ordeal reminded me of that famous Theodore Kittleson painting. My heart sank as I realized that whatever I was looking at was alive and observing me just as I was observing it. I was revolted and took a step back, only to see the entity vanish under the water. A couple of hours passed since, and I was in the galley cooking supper. The strange sightings had almost slipped my mind when I heard a bone-chilling sound. Coming from the porthole behind me, I heard a distinct tapping on the window. Goosebumps flooded my body, and I didn't dare turn around, frightened by what I may have seen on the other side of that glass. The tapping continued, ominously echoing throughout the cabin, then an ear-splitting screech filled the air. Do you know the sound of a chalkboard makes when you drag your nails across it? Yeah, it sounded just like that. Against every fiber of my being telling me not to turn around, I looked over my shoulder, but I saw nothing. Nothing except for three distinct scratch marks running along the glass surface of the porthole. I quickly locked my cabin door, pulled over the curtains, and began writing this entry. As I'm sitting here, fearful of what lurks below, I desperately hope that emergency services are on their way. I don't know how much longer I have. Tuesday, February 21st. The oppressive darkness of the night still dominated the sky as I awoke this morning. Confused, I checked my watch, and it read 4.23 a.m. I wasn't due to wake up for another three hours, but for some reason I laid awake in bed, listening to the waves crashing into the sailboat. I made an attempt to look out of the small porthole situated across the room, but I saw nothing but a void. People often underestimate how dark it can actually get out at sea. In the middle of the night, it is impossible to see anything further away than where the lights emitted from your boat can reach. You can't even see the water surrounding you. Only a vacuum of darkness. I'm not prone to randomly waking up this early, so I laid still, listening for any out-of-place sounds. I was on high alert, and I felt slightly paranoid. Remembering the strange events of the day prior didn't exactly help either. My subconscious mind was obviously telling me that something was wrong, but I had no idea of knowing what or why. Then I heard it. A rhythmic creaking came from the deck above me. The sound was reminiscent of something heavy trudging across the boat. I sat up, intently concentrating on the noise. I heard the sound move from the front of the bow all the way to the stern. They were slow and heavy footsteps. I was certain of it. Along with adrenaline, an immense sense of terror shot through my body and I froze in place. A part of me speculated that it may have been people from a rescue crew. Though deep down, I knew it was not the case. The steps moved in a sinister manner. I could tell. My ship could have been boarded by pirates, but it was highly unlikely I would encounter them all the way out here, especially in the middle of the night. I always made sure to turn off all my lanterns on the boat before going to bed. I heard the creaks move toward the door to the cabin, and I held my breath, praying that whatever was outside couldn't get in. A series of thuds echoed through the boat, and I felt the walls tremble as something was savagely bashing against the door. Terrified, I rose out of bed and grabbed the knife that rested on the nightstand, clutching it tightly in my pale hand. I stood there motionless listening to the deafening beating of my heart accompanied by the banging of wood as I pointed the knife toward the bedroom door. If whatever was out there managed to get into the cabin, it could just as easily tear down the frail bedroom door. Still, it provided me with some level of comfort knowing that there was at least one more barrier between us. But just as quickly as it had arrived, the barrage of thumping abruptly stopped, and everything fell quiet once more. 
The heavy steps moved away from the cabin door, and shortly after, a loud splash could be heard. Was it gone? I stood there for hours, frozen until the first rays of light danced across the waves, and the sun rose on the horizon. It was only then that I felt brave enough to step out of my room and into the cabin. Nothing seemed out of place in the cabin, except for the giant protruding spike, of course. But I dreaded opening the cabin door and stepping out on deck. What if it was still there, just waiting for me? What if it had all been a trick? Knife in hand, I finally mustered up the courage to approach the door. As I swung it open, my heart skipped a beat when I saw what greeted me. The exterior of the door was covered in scratch marks and deep indentations, and a pool of water had gathered on the floor. But that's not the sight that horrified me the most. No, far from it. What really got me worked up was seeing the deep sea camera that I lost yesterday, sitting on the stairs leading up to the deck. It was battered and bruised, but it still remained somewhat intact. I quickly grabbed the camera and rushed inside. I booted up my PC and connected it to the camera. I didn't want to question why or how it ended up there. I was just thankful to have it back. While the footage was loading, I mentally prepared myself for the sights that it had captured. Tuesday, February 21st, Deep Sea Camera Footage Log. The recording starts off as you would expect. I can see myself turning the camera on, and then bringing it toward the edge of the boat. I throw it overboard, and the camera breaches the surface of the water. As it begins to sink, bubbles float in the ocean, making it hard to see anything past them. But they eventually subside, and the top of the spire is revealed. The built-in depth display on the camera tells me how deep down it is in real time. At 50 feet beneath the waves, the spire broadens and becomes thicker and more sturdy. It is still covered in rust and barnacles. However, it stands as a dark contrast against the endless blue expanse. At the 1 minute and 50 seconds mark, the haunting cries of a whale can faintly be heard in the background through the device's microphone. As the camera sinks deeper, it becomes gradually darker in the ocean. At 100 feet, it seems the spire connects to a larger, rectangular foundation, like that of the top of a skyscraper. The building is covered in algae and seaweed, and it looks to be extraordinarily derelict. Though it might resemble a skyscraper in form, the architecture is completely alien in design. It looks like it's made out of rock or maybe concrete, with a few metal support beams scattered about. It also looks... organic. I don't know what else to call it. I guess it kind of reminds me of that weird church in Barcelona. The Sagrada Familia, or whatever it's called. It has several ornamental lines and carvings stretching all the way down its surface. I can't understate how large this thing is. It takes up over half the screen, and the further down the camera sinks, the broader the structure becomes. At 350 feet, small cavernous orifices began to form along the walls. The openings look like they run deep within the structure, and they seem intentional, as opposed to the product of erosion. Suddenly, a stream of bubbles obscures the camera feed, and it begins spinning uncontrollably. I lean forwards in my chair and desperately try to look beyond the bubbles, but it's useless. A deafening static sound can be heard as the camera shambles around. When the bubbles finally disperse, the camera stabilizes and finds itself down 600 feet below the surface. It's dark down here, but I'm still able to see the structure. If it gets dark enough, the camera will automatically turn on powerful floodlights and switch to night vision. So I'm not worried that I will lose the picture. The structure is cast in a dark blue hue now, and the surrounding ocean is nearly black at this point. A school of fish swims by, and I observe a multitude of crustaceans crawling along the surface of the building. The deeper down you get, the less the structure looks like a building, and instead resembles more natural subaquatic formations. What looks to be corals make up the outer layer of the building now, but it is still possible to see original architecture with the decorative runes that are etched into the walls. 
The engravings look to contain the exact same symbols as those on the spike that I previously made a sketch of. At 800 feet, the ocean is completely black, and the device's automated floodlights kick in, illuminating the surrounding waters in a ghastly green glow. The orifices scattered across the structure are larger now, and if I were to guess, I would say they would serve as entrances into the building. A sudden crash catches me off guard and I jolt up in my seat. The camera stands still. It seems I have reached the sea floor. Particles of sand fly everywhere and the camera is temporarily blinded. Once the dust has settled, I get a clear view of the surrounding abyss. The sand below is completely white and there are a couple of critters crawling along the ground. I gawk as I notice what has become of the structure. An enormous, primordial gate meets my gaze. You could probably fit a blue whale in there if you tried. It is decorated with intricate patterns, and through the cracks of its massive iron doors, you can clearly see a bright light source emanating from somewhere within. Upon witnessing the extraordinary find, pits begin to fill in my stomach and shivers run up my spine. A sense of dread overtook me. Who or what was the gate for? I felt nauseous just as the thought of the structure even existing in the first place. Much less that it was located directly below me. The camera lingers on the gate for a while before, in a jagged motion, it starts to ascend. This must have been the points where I started reeling it in. The gate is still visible as the camera rises upwards though it is slowly fading out of frame. However, in the final moments before the gate is out of view entirely, a rapid commotion of shadows can be seen moving behind the gate, obscuring the light between the gaps, and just as the gate completely disappears from view, one can clearly see the doors begin to open. A loud creaking sound ripples through the water as the gate unlocks, and thousands of bubbles release from the newly formed opening partially blinding the camera. As the camera continues to ascend, fast shadows swim by in the distance just out of reach, making them impossible to identify. A low-pitched and distorted cry is picked up by the microphone. The best way to describe it would be to say it sounded like a mix between a whale's cry and a dog's bark. I haven't heard anything like it before. Something swims by right in front of the camera, and the device is sent spiraling out of control. Before it has the chance to stabilize itself, it is hit again, and this time it is shrouded in darkness and the audio cuts out. The screen is black, but the depth display shows it is descending at an impossibly fast rate. Then the feed cuts out. The video just stops. Horrified, I sat still in front of my computer. A flurry of thoughts racing through my mind, but none of them were pleasant. I examine the camera itself, and upon closer inspection, see what looks to be bite marks stretched across its surface. I will spend the rest of my day fortifying the entire cabin, making sure that nothing can get in. I will make this sailboat an impenetrable fortress. I'm not taking any chances. Not anymore. I have a feeling that whatever was here last night will return. Thursday. February 23rd. I'm afraid this might be my final entry. Yesterday was busy, so I didn't have time to write. I don't have much time now, so I'll try to make it short. I apologize. As mentioned earlier, I have fortified the entire sailboat, making it virtually impossible for anyone to get inside. And boy am I glad I did. Last night, a flurry of attacks suddenly erupted from all sides of the boat. Without warning, Something began aggressively scratching at the hull, banging on the door, biting at the walls, etc, etc. You get the idea. I still don't know if there are more of them, or if it's just a large, singular entity, but whatever it is desperately wants to get inside the cabin. And I fear it's not just for a social visit, either. Thankfully, it seems to be docile during the day, but just as soon as the sun disappears from the horizon, comes out to play. It is currently an hour until sundown. 
and I have done everything I could possibly do to prepare myself for the events that will transpire tonight. I have armed myself with several knives and done some push-ups for morale. I am almost certain this will be my end, however, as the cabin door won't withstand another attack. And to top it all off, as if my situation couldn't get any more hopeless, a steady stream of water has begun leaking in from the spike stuck in my hull. I can't emphasize enough how much I loathe the sight of it. That thing is the sole reason I am caught up in my horrible conundrum in the first place. I'm not sure how many days I've been out here. I think it's only been a week. But it feels like a bloody lifetime. Whatever happens tonight, my suffering here will come to an end. Though I highly doubt I will emerge victorious. I have spent most of the day typing up all the relevant logs digitally and hopefully. My frail internet connection is able to upload it somewhere. It will be my lasting legacy, and my story will serve as a cautionary tale to any sailors daring enough to across the Atlantic. I can hear it outside now. Time is running out. I can hear a deep guttural growl below from the depths, and the sound is loud enough to send vibrations through the boat. Something is coming. This will be my final message. If you spot a giant rusty spire sticking out of the water in the middle of the ocean, stay clear of it at all costs. Whatever is down there is unfathomably ancient. And it's not made by humans. Goodbye. I'm not supposed to be sharing this. All of the work we do is strictly confidential, and for good reason, too. If everyone knew about the things we deal with, there would be mass hysteria or panic. It is better to enforce the lie that there is nothing abnormal, that the supernatural simply doesn't exist. However, the things I encounter in the field are disturbing, and I feel like I would go insane if I continue to keep it to myself. I work for an independent research firm that deals with the paranatural. Most people believe ghosts and demons are spirits and supernatural entities. That is far from reality. They are very much alive and are made of flesh and blood. At least in their corporeal states, but it's not entirely correct to describe them as biological entities. At least how we use that term. Almost everything about them defy our present understanding of biology. However, they fit neatly into their own phylogenetic tree, as if they are shadows of our evolution, or as one of my colleagues puts it, a parody of the human experience. Many of these entities are content with keeping to themselves, provided, of course, you don't go intruding on the abandoned mansions and secluded forests they inhabit. Invariably, some idiot ends up stumbling into their territory and getting themselves killed. Then local police are sent to investigate, and they end up calling us or similar organizations. You probably heard of the SCP Foundation. Well, we are like them, but we specialize in the things colloquially known as demons and ghosts while well, they are more generalized. In a way, you could think of us as an independent extension of the SCP, rather than a completely separate thing. Anyways, we relocate the entities if possible, and if it proves too much of a hassle, we simply put up with warning signs and make up some mundane cause of death for the victims. Contrary to common belief, most ghosts are not the tortured souls of humans that died a violent death. They are distinct creatures with many species and are similar in habit to squatters or vermin. They move into secluded areas, but are always proximal to humanity, always in the periphery of civilization. It's not known why they are attracted to human presence. There are many hypotheses, and one particular compelling one is they simply relish human fear and suffering. 
one recent case, I was assigned to a field team dispatched to naturalize an alleged Dawn Weeper. A gynomorphic category 4 physical. Gynomorphic is a term we use to describe entities that anatomically resemble women regardless of their sex. Category 4 is a moderate threat. The higher the number, the more dangerous, and physical, spectral, or phasmopsychic refer to the natural states of an entity. It was rare for them to send researchers like me. Usually field work is completed entirely by the martial department, but some expeditions require scientific advice. I recall the team leader was particular in the fact he is a Spriggan. Yes, you heard me right. A Spriggan is a European relative of the Wendigo. Contrary to popular belief, many demons integrate well into society. Of course, some Spriggans and Wendigos do live up to their kind's bloodthirsty reputation, but they are not a monolith and many are content with consuming raw animal flesh rather than prey on humans. Contrary to common knowledge, Wendigo aren't always terrifying gaunt monstrosities. The well-kempt and well-fed ones can be quite handsome, outside of their disturbingly deep-set eyes. Hollow cheeks and abnormally tall stature, they almost pass as humans. There are female Spriggans as well, but little is known about them. They live in sororities in the deep woods and don't interact with people. Humans do not become Wendigos through acts of cannibalism. They are their separate thing. It is common for Spriggans, vampires, and other civilized demons to be employed in the martial department. They are naturally far stronger than humans and are much faster in their movements. However, they are usually only dispatched in the most dire expeditions. I recall feeling confused why they set a Spriggan on a mere Category 4 physical. I would soon find out. Stepping out of our helicopter and onto the site, we are greeted by a macabre scene that almost made me give up my breakfast. We were at the lip of a clearing. There was torn burlap fabric and garbage bags strewn around, and bloodied human appendages lay limp on the gnarled weeds that were on the ground. There was a ribcage with stringy morsels of flesh dangling from its bleached frame, and remnants of a papery white dress which belonged to its owner. It was still wrapped partially around it. Some distance away from us, partially concealed in the tree, was a makeshift shack cobbled together with rotten boards. The team leader exhaled sharply and shook his head. His voice was authoritative, but it was clear the carnage shook him. He uttered some military-type jargon. His head nodded, and they advanced towards the building. He turned towards me. Labco, this is definitely not a Category 4. What are we dealing with? He barked. I paused for a moment. His remarks echoed my own thoughts. Well, based on the description provided by the police, I blurted as I fumbled through the notes in my fanny pack. Uh, here we go. Sighted at daybreak, black tears streaming endlessly from empty black eye sockets, garbled crying of a woman, black matted hair draping over face, and gaunt frame with putrid rag clothes. It matches the description of a dawn weeper. But this doesn't look like the work of a dawn weeper, does it? I asked rhetorically. He nodded, turning his head over to the shack as a member of the field team jogged out of the decrepit building. Sir, all clear, but Dr. Calf should come look at this... artifact. The team leader nudged me lightly on my shoulder, and they escorted me to the shack. There was a pile of candy wrappers and tin cans piled up to the entrance, which I did my best to step over. The shack was spacious, and the midday light failed to illuminate its dark interior. There were no windows or openings in sight, only the entrance we used to enter the building. So, despite their name, Dawn Weepers aren't actually... crepuscular. They don't like sunlight, though, so they typically stay in the shadows during daytime. 
I exclaimed, attempting to break the silence. The team leader nodded, as he shone his flashlight into a corner of the shack scanning for threats. We walked for a few minutes before we reached what may have once been a bedroom. A mess of boards were haphazardly piled together, blocking what must have been a second entrance to the structure, and lights shone in through spidery gaps between the boards. There was no bed, but a wiry mass of branches, bone, and random pieces of fabric that made up some sort of a nest. This isn't the home of a Dawn Weeper. I spoke with Dran. It's a generic IU, isn't it? The team leader inferred. I nodded solemnly. A generic identity unknown is something we pray we would not encounter. Not a specific ghost or demon. Generic IU is an umbrella term assigned to entities that have not been previously documented or encountered. Think of them like zero-day vulnerabilities in computers. Other members of the team pulled behind us. They were stone-faced and awaiting orders. The team leader opened his mouth to speak before we all glanced behind us with congealed dread. We were tailed by interminable darkness. The entrance through which we entered was gone replaced by solid wooden planks that seemed to have always been there. Lab coat, what's going on? The team leader yelled. A mix of fear and surprise resonated from his voice. I wanted to reply, how should I know? But I knew it wouldn't help anyone. I suppose the IU may have a phasmo psychic state. I replied thoughtfully. Without hesitation, the team members retrieved brown paper pouches from their suits and ingested the powdery substance enclosed inside. It was a dehydrated decoction effective in treating paranatural psychological disturbances. I followed suit. I wish I hadn't. As soon as I ingested the substance, I saw a gaunt, spinely woman silhouetted against the harsh afternoon sunlight streaming in through the entrance. With impossible speed, it crept towards us. Its body contorted into impossible angles accompanied by sickening crunch of bone, which sounded like it was right beside me. Shoot to kill, he ordered. The team didn't need any encouragement. Orange flashes erupted from their assault rifles as a barrage of silver alloy bullets tore into the flesh of the generic IU. Chunks of pale, clammy tissue splattered onto the ground, but the creature did not relent. As it reached us, I realized how impossibly tall it was. It stood at least seven feet from the ground. Greasy black hair erupted from pasty porcelain scalp. Its emaciated body was veiled in yellowed rags, which reeked of excrement and decay. True as the police description, its eye sockets were empty holes so dark that it looked like they were painted on its face. It emitted a muffled scream that sounded like the croaking of a person being strangled. Flailing its lanky arms wildly, it grabbed the soldier standing next to me. The wraith tore a handful of bloody ribs out of its chest and he collapsed on the ground, gasping in shock. The soldiers broke formation bullets whizzed through the air as the creature contorted its torso, deftly evading the projectiles. The back of its hand connected with my waist, and I felt excruciating pain stab through my abdomen. I dropped to the floor and the wraith loomed over me. Black bile gushed out of its eyes, dribbling onto the back of my neck and I felt it rake its finger down my spine. I thought it was the end of me, but a violent force knocked me on my back and sent the creature reeling. Sprawled out like a starfish, I weakly lifted my head, and I saw the team leader barrel into the entity, his hands buried deep in the bullet wounds. The wraith unleashed a guttural scream and flailed its arms madly in the air, desperately clawing at the team leader. Yellow streaks of light trailed from the glowing orange iris of the Spriggan as he ripped a huge throbbing mass of organs and pink flesh from the wraith's sides. I crawled to my fanny pack which lay a few feet before me and made a note in my sketchbook. Class 7, 
androgynous, physical, phasmopsychic, I jotted down with a trembling hand. Medical personnel arrived shortly at the scene. There was one casualty, and all of us were injured. Minor things like broken ribs, thankfully. Fortunately, there was no evidence of biohazardous properties or curses. The creature's remains were extracted and sent away for analysis, and a cover-up story was created to explain the civilian deaths. I was shaken, but it was a nice interruption to the monotony of lab research, and I got to witness the discovery of a new species of ghosts.